Let's talk about the climate. It's worrisome. Temperatures are rising. Things are becoming unstable. Panic is setting in. Sure, all that describes what's also happening with climate change, but I'm talking the political climate. People are in hyperdrive selling fear. In the world that surrounds us, there are terrorists and there are home invaders. Unlike Al-Qaeda, these are people who are living here among us, and that, I think, is the biggest threat here. Carjackers, knockout gamers. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And killers who scheme to destroy our country with massive storms of violence. One day, I, I hope that I'm wrong, but one day there will be an attack that's successful. Fear of immigrants, fear of religious groups, fear of terrorism, fear of inaction, fear of too much action. Those are things we all need to worry about, but we can also get hooked on fear. And sometimes we become suspicious about the explanation given to us for scary events. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley, and welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology, and we devote one episode a month to critical thinking, skeptic check. In this episode, well, we acknowledge that, generally speaking, we're rational animals, thanks to a few hundred thousand years of evolution. But still, sometimes we give in to base instincts, fear, suspicion. We even imagine cabals and conspiracies. Turn on the news if you need a dose of what I'm talking about. Now, there's no lack of punditry to hash out the political policy. So we'll focus instead on why it is that these emotions sometimes take over. It turns out that fear and suspicion are evolutionarily adaptive. So we'll discuss that the top conspiracies in the news today, and some popular alien cover-up theories. It's Skeptic Check, Fear Itself. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror. In 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt addressed a nation that was in the grip of the Great Depression. He spoke to the fear that accompanied the economic crisis. Fear at a national level has always been with us. Today, among other worries, the specter of terrorism has people on edge. So, if fear is always with us, well, maybe it's time we got to know it better. My name is Margie Kerr. I'm a sociologist who studies fear. One of Margie's questions is why we derive pleasure from the unpleasant. That said, there are different kinds of fearful situations, those in which you have little control, you're helpless, such as an economic collapse or a terrorist attack, witnessing a violent crime, and those over which you do have some control. And it's the second lot that she studies and that reveal why chilling experiences can be thrilling. And scaring people can also bring in the moolah. It used to be that the sites you went to as a tourist, they were exciting in themselves, touring the landmarks of Paris, gazing into the layered abyss of the Grand Canyon. Well, the bar for attracting tourists just got higher. A lot of different museums and historical sites and destinations are trying to, you know, incorporate some thrill, some scare into the location to encourage people to come out. So, for example, at the Grand Canyon, they now have the glass walk. They put that into the Eiffel Tower also. Ooh la la. With a glass floor, you can see it's a long way down, n'est-ce pas? Margie Kerr says she's a fear junkie. And we'll hear why we're drawn to terrifying experiences in a moment. But first... From the safety of your comfy listening environment, let's head up to Canada. In Toronto, the Canadian National Railway Company has a famous building, the CN Tower. Well, I've been there. It's a towering tower. And like a lot of tall buildings, people head straight to the top. At this tower, however, some gaze at the city through protective glass, but the more daring step outside. They built a platform that goes all the way around the tower. All right, let me tell you that that platform is 1,168 feet, or 356 meters, up, above the hard, unforgiving pavement. And for that matter, even the pavement that is forgiving. The platform is a steel grate, and it goes all the way around the building. So you step onto this, and I remind you, it's all outside, and into a metal harness. But not in that order. 
i was strapped into a harness that was attached to a kind of a trail rack kind of thing that went around the outside of it so you're like an acrobat, only there's no net, and you're not an acrobat you know, just looking at this photo, i feel my stomach drop. i don't know how anyone could do this i know, no guardrail ok, so you're in a harness, presumably checking first to make sure it's actually fastened and then Instead of clinging to the exit door, the guy next to you, you're asked to move to the very edge of the platform. And you have to lean out over the side, both, you know, facing front and with your back to the ground. Nope, nope, I could not do this. I absolutely could not do this. And yet Margie paid to do this, almost $200, to feel the sensation of paralyzing fear. Once I stepped out onto that grate, my thinking brain just completely shut down. I really felt myself go into a full threat response where my body just took over and my eyes kind of got blurry. I felt dizzy. I thought I had peed my pants, honestly. And I'm not even afraid of heights, but there was something about walking out on that ledge and looking down that just, it just stopped me right where I was standing. Well, I hope so, because one more step and kerplop. Margie says that the edge walk caused the most intense surge of fear that her body had ever experienced. But then something changed. Another emotion took over. I felt amazing about, I would say maybe 20 minutes into the experience, as when I really just started to trust that I, I wasn't actually going to die. I felt so good because, you know, I could have just gone back inside, but I didn't. I forced myself to stay there, to lean over the edge, and even though I was connected by a harness, there was a very real feeling of accomplishment there. And I love that. I love that there are still things that we can do that are going to surprise us. For Margie Kerr, that includes skydiving, visiting haunted houses, and one really intense Japanese roller coaster. These thrilling things don't produce the kind of fear we feel at the threat of mortal danger, but we're still drawn to experiencing fear. We're the descendants of, you know, humans who were rewarded for being novelty seeking, who were rewarded for going out and facing something scary. And it led to finding new sources of food, new places to live, new mates to start new families. So it's really worked into our DNA to be rewarded by doing scary things. And for a lot of people, and of course, this is going to vary based on socioeconomic status and geography, but we're looking for something to push ourselves in a way that is going to leave us with that feeling of success and accomplishment. So that's, I think, why we choose to do a lot of safe, scary things, because success is pretty much guaranteed. <laughs> I beat the big coaster. Well, right. well, 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 what's happening chemically, if you will, in our bodies when we confront these fearful situations? Yeah, the fight or flight response or the threat response it's a response that is really responsible for keeping us alive. And what happens is our brain and body start releasing a whole cascade of chemicals like adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, there's endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. All of these things are being released to turn our bodies into well-fueled, very efficient machines that are, have one priority, and that's to survive. So that means that a lot of our higher thinking, so abstract thought, logical thinking is going to be pushed to the back burner as messages that are trying to get energy to our muscles and modulating our heart rate and our respiration. Those are all going to take first priority so that we feel like we have the ability to either fight or run. Fear is obviously a survival tool. I mean, if, if you're not afraid of potentially dangerous situations, you're out of the gene pool, right? I mean, even animals have this emotion. The squirrels run away from me. It's just part of being alive in a dangerous world, right? Absolutely. Every species has a threat response. Even snails are going to have a response that is triggered by something that is considered, you know, a, an assault. So it is absolutely necessary that we have a reaction to threats. And there, there have been studies with people who have damage to that part of their brain, primarily the amygdala, and they don't have that fear response and they end up, you know, getting hurt um, and, you know, really putting themselves in a lot of dangerous situations. Maybe uh, fear is a more useful emotion than being happy. 
Well, you know, there's a lot in common between being happy and being afraid. At the chemical level, a lot of the same neurotransmitters are involved. Even when you think about that state of excitement, that state of anticipation, it's usually dependent on context. So, you know, if you are in a dark alley and truly you know, fearful for your life, then you're going to interpret that as fear. But if you're in a scary movie or in a haunted house, that same feeling is going to be seen as potentially enjoyable. So at the chemical level, these two states can look very similar. It's really the sense that we bring to it. It's the interpretation. Huh? Yeah. But there's the terror of situations we choose, skydiving, I don't know, bungee jumping, whatever. And the terror of situations we don't choose, like being mugged or uh, skidding a car on ice. Do you distinguish between the two? I mean, do we get addicted to both kinds of, of fear? I do distinguish between the two, and uh, studies have shown that choice and control make a huge difference. I mean, that usually is the difference between a situation being traumatic and a situation turning into a growth experience or, or being enjoyable. So they have done studies where they've given people opportunities to remove themselves from a scary situation and then ones where they haven't been able to escape. And, and we see that in those inescapable situations, the results are usually traumatic or at least negative, you know, that it's not an enjoyable experience. But when we do have control and we're the ones who are saying, no, I can do this. I want to push myself. I can do this. The results can be positive. So choice and control are essential for enjoying fear anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what about this difference? Uh, the fear of a roller coaster ride and uh, the fear of being locked up in a prison at night, which you've done. One distracts your mind. The other puts you in a real situation with, I guess, a real potential danger. Uh, can you describe the difference here? Yeah, the roller coaster is more about that physical sensation that happens. A lot of the adrenaline and the disorientation and this lack of balances, you're being twisted and turned around. When I was in Eastern State Penitentiary in their punishment cells, in that space, it's a different type of fear, at least in, in the body. You know, in that space, there's nothing in your environment that you can use to distract yourself. So you do end up turning to your thoughts. And of course, you know, as the saying goes, the monsters in your head are often more scary than the ones in real life. Yeah. Well, I, I must say that I find nightmares generally more scary than scary movies. Yes, our brains are insanely imaginative and can create just the perfect combination of everything that will terrify us the most. You've studied haunted houses and noticed the difference between Japanese haunted houses and those in the United States. Maybe you could describe what the difference is. Sure. So the threat response is universal, but how we express our fear can be very different based on culture. And walking through the haunted houses in Japan, I noticed that as groups walked through together, they would get closer and closer together with each startle scare. Whereas in the U.S., you know, that happens sometimes, but more often when I watch people, they end up, you know, running forward or running backwards. But in Japan, I saw groups forming circles around each other. There was also a big difference in the content, a lot more focus on narrative and story and making sure that visitors were immersed in the experience and uh, less emphasis on, you know, startle scares or big animatronics. So I, I thought that that was very interesting. This sounds like, you know, uh, something pointing to cultural differences. I don't imagine this is biological. Right. In Japan, you know, it's traditionally a more collectivist society. So more of a concern for the group rather than the individual. I mean, that's a overgeneralization, but I think that that is contributing to it. And also a really long history of folklore around ghosts, around hauntings, and a lot of the haunted houses were built around specific storylines and things that had happened to people that really made you feel connected and more goal-oriented for the group. Well, when we look around the world today, there are many things to be worried about. But have we as a society become addicted to being afraid? For example, take the threat of terrorism. There's a greater chance that you'll die in a car accident or even in your bed than becoming a victim of terrorism. And yet there is a panic that's running through the country now. Are we addicted to this? And do we get a thrill from this kind of fear? I don't know that we're addicted to it. I think that we definitely are manipulating and triggering our threat response in ways that we never really evolved to handle. You know, when we turn on the computer or the TV or our phones, we're constantly 
seen images that can tap into that threat response. And that wasn't the reality for most of our evolution. So I think that we're trying to figure out how to manage our threat response in this day and age when it can be triggered so easily and and repeatedly and where marketers and politicians and everybody sees how effective it is to scare people into action. And so everybody is doing it all the time. And so I don't know how much of it is a reflection of us being addicted to it as it is media marketers, politicians using fear to sell their agendas, because this is something that we have evolved to respond to. We see something scary or something different and startling, we're going to respond. So I think it's just a new day and age and just trying to figure out how we can really understand what we should be afraid of, which involves a lot of bringing that thinking brain back into the picture to think about what are we really at risk of. Well, finally, this evolved response, it's all good for Hollywood, right? I mean, look at all the TV shows and movies that promise to scare you. Yeah, it's a huge industry and it's continuing to grow. I think that people, they do enjoy being scared and laughing, but you also see differences between cultures. You know, in the U.S., the horror industry, the thrill industry is very big, but that's not the case around the world. And so I'm really interested in trying to figure out what it is that makes Americans so excited to go out and scare themselves. And I think I've got, you know, some pretty good answers that, that I talk about in the book. But I want to see in other societies, you know, what's happening there that they don't enjoy it. In Bogota, I talked to political scientists and anthropologists, historians, psychologists, and lots of just people on the street. And everybody said, yeah, no, I'm not going to pay to go get scared. We live in Bogota. You just have to walk out on the street. And I thought that they were joking, but that is the sentiment there is that, you know, they don't want to see movies that are really graphic or violent. You know, they exist, but they're not as popular as the comedies and the dramas. And I think it's connected to the political tension, the reality that Bogota is a more conflict-ridden society. It's much better than it used to be, but it's still different than most Americans' realities. So being scared is best when you have that harness or when it's just shadows on a big white screen. Exactly. When we're behind the protective frame. <laughs> <laughs> Margie Kerr, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. Margie Kerr is a sociologist who studies fear, and she is the author of Scream, Chilling Adventures in the Science of Fear. Margie pointed out how fear is being monetized, whether it's at the Eiffel Tower, the Grand Canyon, or the CN Tower. Uh, but she also points out that there's really a re different kind of reaction to fear that we have, depending on whether you know, we want to be scared or whether it's something unplanned, like getting mugged, for example. We don't enjoy that. Would you pay $200 to harness yourself to the top of a building just for the thrill of feeling vertigo? I'm not sure I'd do that, but I'd pay $10 to see Friday the 13th Part 6. There's but, a Part 6? <laughs> I don't know if there's part six, but if there is, I'd still pay. But the, the interesting thing to me is that being scared is actually part of our evolutionary toolkit. And it's very close to being daring. And being daring is a good thing. We talk about daring do. I notice we don't talk about scaring do. The truth is, we do have a lot of things to fear. And sometimes our brains can go a little nuts trying to make sense of weird phenomena, and we conjure up conspiracy theories. Some of my favorite alien ones are coming up. It's our monthly look at critical thinking on big picture science, skeptic check, fear itself. I know a few things about conspiracies, and that's because part of my day is spent addressing them, specifically the idea that aliens have made an appearance on our planet or a planet nearby, and that fact is being covered up. Since I'm part of the team at the SETI Institute using radio telescopes to try and eavesdrop on aliens, naturally people assume I'm the person to talk to if they think they've learned something about alien presence. So nearly every day I get at least one email or a phone call and to give you an idea of how this often unfolds, let me tell you about an incident that occurred I don't know, just a couple of days ago actually. Some guy gets in touch with me 
And he says, look, Seth, uh, you know, I'm not a scientist, but I follow what you guys do. I'm very interested. Have you seen this? And attached to the message was a photo. And it was this black and white photo of some rocky terrain somewhere. It actually had been a photo made by one of the early Mars rovers. The photo was made in 2004. So I look at the photo, and what you see in the photo are, you know, sort of bumpy things, just like, I don't know, just about any rock you look at. And he was pointing to something in the photo that he thought was very significant. You could see sort of what looked like, I don't know, tentacles or maybe a bit of a body. Uh, It was a little hard. I have to say it was somewhat ambiguous, but that's kind of what it looked like. But he said, look, it was very obvious what it was. It was a crinoid. And a fossilized crinoid. A crinoid is a sea creature. Uh, we have crinoids today. You know, they s- sit around in the bottom of the ocean and they have their mouths at the top with these sort of feathery things around them. Uh, but there were a lot more crinoids actually a couple hundred million years ago. And that, that may not matter. He's claiming that this was a fossilized animal, a fossilized animal that had existed on Mars. The implication was that Mars not only had life, but it had complicated sea creatures. And since this was a NASA photo, why hadn't we heard anything about this from the space agency itself? Well, there was only one reason. NASA was downplaying the story of life on Mars because they didn't want the public to know. Okay, hang on for just a second, Seth. I'm going to stop you there, and we'll hear in a moment what you said to this guy. But first, let's look at the bigger picture of this sort of thing, because it's not unusual. It actually happens a lot as we try to make sense of something weird or a disturbing event, and there are famous examples of this. Psychologist Rob Brotherton shares one, the story of Umbrella Man. One of my favorite examples is the Umbrella Man, which is to do with the Kennedy assassinations. People noticed that there was this guy standing at the side of the road at basically the moment Kennedy was shot. And this guy was holding up an open umbrella, which made no sense because it was a sunny day. It was windy. It wasn't umbrella weather. Nobody else had an umbrella. And so for some people, this was a dot and they connected it to the assassination. They said, maybe this umbrella man was part of a conspiracy. Maybe he was signaling to the assassins. Maybe he had a gun hidden inside his umbrella. Maybe he shot Kennedy. Okay, the umbrella man theory is nothing if not seemingly logical. I mean, a guy has an umbrella open on a sunny day. That's weird, right? And the president is going to drive right by this suspicious character. Well, it makes total sense to assume that this suspicious guy with the umbrella had something to do with the assassination. Until we start digging deeper. Fortunately, we do know the real reason why the umbrella man was there. Turns out that he was this guy who was just kind of heckling Kennedy. He knew that the black umbrella that he was holding was a sore spot with the Kennedy family, going back to JFK's dad, Joseph Kennedy, who had been the ambassador to Britain in the run-up to World War II. The British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was noted for carrying around a black umbrella, and he'd been criticized for his policy of appeasement towards the Nazis. And so this guy, the umbrella man, he just took along this umbrella to kind of heckle JFK. And nobody could have guessed that before the government tracked him down in the 1970s and got this explanation. Nobody could have guessed that. And so before that explanation was found out, the conspiracy theories were kind of the best, most satisfying, coherent explanation that was available. So the real reason for this umbrella guy being there in Dallas is kind of complicated. I mean, who could possibly guess that the umbrella had a symbolic meaning for the Kennedy family, that it represented Neville Chamberlain's appeasement policy, and that JFK's father had supported that, and that this umbrella guy was making a statement about how he felt about the Kennedy family? It's really an obscure story that has nothing to do with the assassination. So the conspiracy idea might have seemed more reasonable, but it didn't agree with the evidence. Okay, Seth, so getting back to the story of the guy who contacted you about the sea creature on Mars. Yes, a fossilized sea creature. What was his relationship to the evidence that you offered up? I didn't have evidence, but I did have arguments. And so what I wrote back was, hey, look, this is periodolia, which is just a Greek word for our brain's ability to find familiar objects in in random patterns, like seeing faces in the clouds. All right, so the crinoid was just his brain turning the, I don't know, the corrugations in this rock into a sea creature. But the interesting thing was that when I suggested this, the correspondent came back insisting that I look harder at the photo and that I get a bunch of biologists to look hard at the photo. And the more I talked with the guy, the less friendly he became because there was only one correct response to his claim that NASA was hiding evidence for life on Mars. And that was, 
I had to agree with him. The facts are that I get a lot of photos like this. Every week you get photos that were made on Mars that look like something. And usually they're critters, but sometimes they're little statues of women. Sometimes they're Nazi helmets. Sometimes they're auto parts. And the facts are, just because you can look at a photo and say, I see something in there that reminds me of something I've seen in the zoo or at the museum, doesn't mean that that's good evidence for life on Mars. Have any of these photos been convincing? Well, actually not. I mean, there was one a couple of weeks ago where people were claiming they saw a crab on the surface of Mars, right, in the rock. And this was a big story. This photo was circulated all over the place, and it kind of looked like a crab. But on the other hand, it also looked kind of like a windblown rock. And, you know, unless you can go up there and grab it and put it under the microscope and see, you know, crab cells or something like that, you have to say, you know... In the photo, it kind of looks like a crab, but I can go to the mountains and I see a mountain that kind of looks like the face of a man, but it doesn't mean it's a man. It sounds like, in the case of the Umbrella Man, uh, people jump to a conclusion that seems reasonable because their eyes are telling them that it's reasonable. Are there other popular alien stories? Well, the ones I hear tend to fall into two categories. They're, They're those where they're coming to me with evidence that they've collected right? Uh, Photos that they've made or videos that they've made. And the other kind of contact I get a lot is from people who are making the case that the aliens are, for example, visiting Earth based on what other people have collected as evidence. So, you know, if a bunch of uh, uh, Air Force pilots claim that they've seen UFOs or, or astronauts claim they've seen UFOs, then people will argue with me, you should believe this because these guys are credible. So that's an argument from uh, authority kind of deal. But the more interesting ones are the people who send me evidence that they have collected personally. Can you give an example where the back and forth between you and, and one of these guys actually escalated? Well, yeah, I try to, <laughs> I try not to get frustrated. But I think the the most uh, interesting one for me was years ago in Boulder, Colorado, where some people had a video, and they said, "Look at this video," and in this video, you could see something f- suddenly fly across the sky at very high speed, and they claimed that you know no airplane could do that; it was moving too fast. Well, it was certainly moving at high speed on the video, but of course, how fast it was really going depended on, you know, how far the object was away. And I thought, you know, this could be a bird that's only 50 feet up. It could be a bug that's only 5 feet up. I mean, how do I know that it's UFO? Because there was no way to know how far away it was. So I talked to this guy, and he had a buddy. They were in it together. And I suggested to them, why don't the two of you go out on a day where there are a few clouds around and then see if you get something flying across the sky then? Because if there are clouds behind it, then at least you have some idea of how far away it is. How did they respond to that? They didn't want to do it. They said, well, our equipment's not good enough. Well, their equipment was plenty good enough. I mean, it wasn't that. But they, they were afraid, I think, I think, they were afraid of finding out that what they thought was evidence of alien visitation was something very much more prosaic. Can you give me one example of a particularly interesting case? Well, there was a guy in Italy who sent me several photos that he had made in which you could see these sort of light blobs sort of hanging over the uh, street there (laughs) in whatever city he was living in. But I noticed that not only were the photos made at night, and of course you could understand that, maybe the light blobs are hard to see during the day, but what I did notice is that every photo that showed the light blob, there was also a street lamp somewhere in the photo. Okay, so you had this really bright light source there in the photo, and I was sure that all that was happening is that that light was bouncing around the optics of his camera, making these blobs. And I wrote back to him, and I said, I think that's what it is. And he came back, and he sent me 10 more photos, but all of them had street lights too. And I said, show me one where you don't have a street lamp in the photo, and if you still see the blobs. And then he went silent. It sounds as though people resist you presenting counter-arguments to their argument of aliens among us. It, well, they do, and I can understand that. I mean, look, you've seen something you think it's really important, because if you're talking about proof of aliens, of course that's important. And you just want to verify that your discovery is real by calling up somebody who's, as it were, in the alien business, and they say, well, actually, no, you fooled yourself. Uh, that's not very good evidence. So then I become part of the cover-up. This massive cover-up, which doesn't just involve NASA, now it involves a SETI scientist, and who knows who else are all conspiring to keep from the public the fact that we have found good evidence for life in space. But that doesn't make any sense. There wouldn't be a cover-up, right? This could be the most interesting science discovery of all time. Every scientist would want to get in on it. And the idea that there's good evidence for life on Mars, whether it's crabs or crinoids or whatever, I mean, nothing would help NASA more than to find evidence of life on Mars. They have absolutely no incentive to cover it up. 
What would it take to have a worldwide cover-up of alien visitation or evidence of life on Mars? Well, you'd have to have the thousands of NASA scientists and scientists at just about every other university who work on the Mars photos, for example, to agree that they're going to ignore evidence for life on the red planet. As far as UFOs and so forth, well, UFOs are seen around the world. So this would require that every government hide the evidence, not just the Americans, but, but the Botswanans and the Brazilians and the Bolivians and so forth. It involves a conspiracy with tens of thousands of people. So you got to say, that doesn't sound quite as reasonable as the suggestion that maybe it's not what you think it is. Seth, you have a very interesting job having to consider some of these colorful stories. Well, it, it, it certainly is interesting, and you never know what that next caller is going to have to tell you. But on the other hand, uh, many of them have uh, rather similar stories. It sounds as though some people are resistant to hearing the evidence, uh, but you know a lot about evidence because you're a scientist. Psst, Gary here. Oh, right. i got to talk fast before they realize I've commandeered the mic. I want to talk to you about the secret stuff that no one wants you to know about, and it's dark. I have strong evidence that big picture science isn't run by Seth and Molly, but by shadow producers who hold the true power. Sure, everyone will deny it, but think about it. Have you noticed that Seth Shostak has 11 letters in his name, and Molly Bentley has 12 letters? And that adds up to 23, and there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. Coincidence? That doesn't just happen, unless that number is a message for someone or something. And that, oh, I gotta go. Yeah, no, well, that's actually very interesting. Coming up, some conspiracy theories are about aliens, but others trade in darker themes. They suggest hidden explanations and cover-ups for devastating events, but our brains are wired to find them plausible. Find out why. It's our monthly look at critical thinking on Big Picture Science. Skeptic check, fear itself. Earlier in the show... Margie Kerr described what happens chemically when we're afraid and why we're likely to seek out experiences that scare the bejesus out of us. Now, her research is mainly about the kind of fear that arises from situations we can control, true, but she also said that those who influence popular and political culture capitalize on our fear response. You know, when we turn on the computer or the TV or our phones, we're constantly seen images that can tap into that threat response. And that wasn't the reality for most of our evolution. So I think that we're trying to figure out how to manage our threat response in this day and age when it can be triggered so easily and repeatedly and, you know, where marketers and politicians and everybody sees how effective it is to scare people into action. And so everybody is doing it all the time. Scary things happen and there are real reasons to be afraid. But we should also ask, who stands to gain by making us fearful? Also, when scary things happen, it's natural to want to know why. But sometimes the why is complicated or the reason is too simple. Either way, you might find that your suspicions are aroused. Indeed, you might find yourself asking, what's really going on? And what, what don't they want us to know? Conspiracy theories are nothing new. In a moment, you'll hear whether the burning of Rome in 64 AD was an inside job. Psychologist Rob Brotherton writes about the reasons we are drawn to conspiracies. And when I say we, I don't just mean the nutty tinfoil hat crowd. All of us. I talked earlier about conspiracy theories about aliens. Well, those are at least generally harmless. But some conspiracy theories take on a more somber tone with consequences for how we understand or fail to understand the complexities behind really terrible events. Just hours after the attacks in Paris and before the attackers were even identified, the truth among conspiracy theorists was already taking shape online. So there were theories that the entire event was staged, that it was faked, it was set up by the French government or the American government or some shady authority, the Illuminati maybe. There were ideas that the people involved, the people we saw in videos and photos from the scene were actors, they were just playing along, there hadn't really been this atrocity committed. And we see this with a lot of events recently. This is a relatively recent phenomenon, but after things like the Sandy Hook shooting here in America, the Boston bombings, um, any terrorist attack, any big event like this, we see theories saying that it's all a hoax, that it was staged. 
Well, the attack was on Friday the 13th, so I suppose that was used in support of the idea that it was the Illuminati. For that matter, who else takes the blame a lot? I'm thinking of the Freemasons or the New World Order, whatever that is. Uh, there's this idea that there's a cabal here, right? Yeah, and what we find is that a lot of the ideas, they don't really have a lot of definition. The ideas blend together, so whether it's the Illuminati or the Bilderberg Group or the Freemasons or the U.S. government, uh, a lot of the ideas don't really get to a coherent theory of what happened. They're just saying, they're asking questions. They're saying there's something we don't know here. We're not being told the truth. Somebody is covering something up. Well, what is it that prompts them to do that? I mean, what kind of events set them speculating? Why did they pick on Paris? Is it just because it's so horrible? Yeah, so one of the biases that I write about in the book, one of these psychological biases that we all have wired into our brain is something called the proportionality bias. And what this says is essentially that whenever anything big happens in the world, a big, momentous, significant event, we are wired to look for proportionally big, significant, momentous explanations. But simply, we think that big events have big causes. And so when something as huge and shocking as a terrorist attack happens, we look for big explanations. It's not satisfying to think that just some small, barely organized group of people could have pulled this off. We look for a bigger explanation and a vast conspiracy involving hundreds or thousands of people going on through time. That fits uh, with this bias that we have built into our brain. You write that this is not a new phenomenon, uh, the idea of conspiracy theories, it, that uh, it goes way, way back. What, what, what are some of the older conspiracy theories that you've uncovered? Yeah, so we see conspiracy thinking going all the way back in time, basically to the beginning of recorded history. So as far back as ancient Athens and Rome and the playwrights and the political speeches, we see conspiracy thinking back then. People were explaining local events like failed crops and political intrigues and stuff as a result of a conspiracy. Um, a great example is the Great Fire of Rome, uh, which happened in the year 64 uh, AD, destroyed two-thirds of the city of Rome at the time. And immediately, within days of the events, people were speculating about how it might have been an inside job. Maybe the Emperor Nero organized the fire, maybe he started it, and maybe he was fiddling on the roof of the palace while the city burned, celebrating what he'd done. Yeah, but you write that he wasn't actually fiddling, he was singing. Well, indeed, because fiddles hadn't been invented back then, so we know that he couldn't have been fiddling. There were ideas that he was playing his lyre or he was just singing and uh, having a good time. But yeah, we know that he wasn't playing the fiddle. We can be sure of that. What are some of the top conspiracy theories making the rounds these days? Well, so looking at the surveys, there's quite a lot of data on this. And one of the most popular conspiracy theories still is the assassination of JFK. People saying that Lee Harvey Oswald didn't do it alone, that somebody else was involved. And all sorts of culprits have been named over the years, whether it's Lyndon Baines Johnson or the Freemasons or the Cubans or the Mafia. There are all sorts of villains, according to these conspiracy theories, but more than half of the American public, according to various surveys over the year, buy into that idea that Lee Harvey Oswald didn't act alone. So still, all these years later, that's one of the most widely believed conspiracy theories. And in terms of more recent events, the 9-11 attacks, still there are a lot of conspiracy theories about those and they're more widely believed than you might think. So again, according to different surveys, uh, around half of the American public think that the US government isn't telling the entire truth, that the event should be reinvestigated. And asking more specific questions like, do you think the Bush administration knew in advance about the attacks or do you think they orchestrated the attacks? We find smaller numbers of people believe those, but still quite substantial. Around a quarter or a third of the American public would agree with those ideas. Well, there were theories making the rounds that the 2012 Sandy Hook shooting, in which 20 children died, didn't really happen. What sort of proof would be offered to support such an idea? Well, so with the Sandy Hook theories, with the Boston bombing, with the Paris attacks, all these events that are streamed live basically on 24-hour rolling news. They're all over the internet within minutes of the attacks occurring. We often don't know exactly what happened, who was responsible until it's been investigated. But we have all this information available immediately. And so some people troll through all this information. They look at the pictures, they look at the eyewitness statements, and they look for anything that doesn't immediately seem to fit. Any anomaly, any little factoid that can be construed as evidence potentially of a conspiracy. And if they can find anybody who seems to look similar, people who look a bit similar in pictures from Sandy Hook or from Paris, then they say, well, look, we've found one of these actors, one of what they call crisis actors, 
who supposedly have been paid to be at the scene to act as if this attack has occurred when in fact it hasn't. My goodness. But, Rob, it strains my credulity to think that uh, there are people who think that the shooting at Sandy Hook was faked. And yet you've written that belief in conspiracy theories is not limited to people who are, shall we say, somehow outside the norm, the tinfoil hat crowd, that we're all vulnerable to this. Why is that? Well, absolutely. And the, the Sandy Hook truthers and people like that, they're at the extreme end of the spectrum, I think it's fair to say. But again, like you say, we all do this. We're all susceptible. This is one of the things that our brain is best at, is finding these anomalies, finding pieces of information that don't seem to go together or that we can connect together, connecting the dots. But it isn't just a lack of education. No. So one of the ideas that has been put forward for why some people believe conspiracy theories is that it's to do with being simple-minded, with looking for simple explanations for complex events and preferring that kind of concrete, simple explanation over more chaotic explanations. But that doesn't seem to be the case. There's no data that really supports that. In fact, if anything, people who believe conspiracy theories score a little bit higher on being open-minded. So they're more open to these kind of theories that go against mainstream wisdom. But if we're wired to be sympathetic to conspiracy theories, there must be or must have been some evolutionary advantage to that. I mean, what might that have been? Yeah, so another one of the psychological biases that I write about is something I call the intentionality bias. And this is the idea that basically whenever anything ambiguous happens in the world, we're wired to assume that there was some intent behind it, that somebody meant it to happen. And so in thinking about our evolution, this makes perfect sense that we would be uh, designed to think this way, so to speak, because if, you know, say a rock falls off a cliff and almost kills us, we could assume that it was just a random event that it was pushed off by the wind or something like that, or we could assume that maybe somebody pushed it. And if it was just the wind, we can't really do anything about it, it was just a chance event, but if it was somebody who did it, who meant to harm us, then knowing that or assuming that would be good for us. We could take action to potentially protect ourselves. And so conspiracy theories might be the modern uh, product of that way of thinking. You know, if somebody is out to harm us, then it's good to be a little bit suspicious, to be on guard. So it's a matter of, uh, well, you might be wrong, but on the other hand, there's some advantage in assuming that you're right. Exactly. And often the cost of being wrong is negligible, whereas the benefits of being right would be great. But, Rob, there are conspiracies, of course. Um, Watergate is an obvious example. So maybe we should uh, define a little bit better what's meant by conspiracy theory, because that's a little different than just a conspiracy. I mean, I have conspiracies all the time with my colleagues here about, <laughs> you know, how we're going to get some work done or whatever, that kind of thing, and even worse ones. Absolutely. This is a really important point, is that me and my colleagues in psychology, what we're not saying is that conspiracy theories are necessarily false. And we're certainly not saying that conspiracies never happen in the world, because of course they do all the time, whether it's on a small scale like in our personal lives or on a bigger scale, these political conspiracies like Watergate or MKUltra, the Tuskegee study and things like that. And so you're right, it's important to be careful when we try and define conspiracy theory. And so one of those characteristics is that conspiracy theories are inherently unproven. And by that, I don't mean that they don't satisfy some kind of mainstream scientific consensus of what is true and what's false. I mean that built into the theories, they're saying that these events are ongoing, that they haven't been fully revealed, that most people don't realize the truth. And whenever a real conspiracy does come to light, like Watergate, then the conspiracy theories start looking over the next horizon, around the next corner. Well, if that's true, what aren't they still telling us? I get a lot of calls about how UFOs are buzzing the skies or how we're covering up evidence of alien visitation. But while I disagree, I can't say that it's somehow terrible for humanity if people want to believe this is true. So what about, in general, the belief in conspiracy theories? Maybe, the, you know, just like the fact that some people like to tell puns and others don't like that, it, it's really nothing to worry about. Well, again, I think there's a spectrum here. I think a lot of conspiracy theories are mostly harmless. People don't really base important life decisions on, you know, believing in UFOs and stuff like that. But at the other end of the spectrum, there are conspiracy theories that can have real tangible consequences. So if we look at anti-vaccine conspiracy theories, they can influence parents to not vaccinate their children against these 
potentially deadly diseases. If we look at climate change conspiracy theories, they can influence people to not take action to protect the environment. And if we look at certain conspiracy theories that play into people's prejudice, then there have been conspiracy theories like the Protocols of Zion, this conspiracy theory that alleged that Jewish people all over the world were conspiring to dominate society. And that gave rise to widespread anti-Semitism, especially in Germany in the run-up to World War II. Hitler was very influenced by his belief in the Protocols of Zion. And he saw the Jewish people as this metaphysical enemy of the Aryan race who he had to take action to prevent their global conspiracy. And so some conspiracy theories, when they tap into our fears or our prejudices, they can influence people's behavior. They can have negative, potentially disastrous outcomes. What do you recommend to disabuse somebody of these pernicious conspiracy theories? Well, this is where we get to the limits of the research. Unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of research into what we can do to tackle these beliefs or, you know, indeed whether we should. Um, if there are some conspiracy theories that we should just let it be, let people believe what they want to believe, or with other ones like the anti-vaccine or the uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, what we can do to persuade people that they're wrong. Thinking about confirmation bias, it makes dissuading people of their conspiracy beliefs particularly problematic. Because as soon as we start telling somebody that, you know, the evidence goes against their conspiracy theory, well, that's exactly what they would expect to hear if they believe the theory, because they would expect that the conspirators would be putting out disinformation designed to mislead them. Well, finally, Rob, how do I know that you've not been put up to writing this book by maybe the Illuminati or the Freemasons as part of their scheme to control the world? <laughs> I would ask for a much bigger book advance from the Illuminati. <laughs> Rob Brotherton, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. My pleasure. Rob Brotherton is a psychologist, an adjunct assistant professor at Barnard College, and the author of Suspicious Minds, Why We Believe Conspiracy Theories. Now, what we've heard in the show, fear. We love it. We hate it. It keeps us alive, obviously, but it also tempts us to explore, to take risks, kind of the yin and yang of fear. But when we feel fearful without wanting to, when world events give me goosebumps, we can all too quickly look for a deeper explanation. Not the devil, as we would have said a thousand years ago, but maybe a secret group of people conspiring to do us harm. Well, it's something to keep in mind when we think about how fear and fear of conspiracy is used to shape our opinions and even influence our policy. I'm back, and you'll be glad that I am. You think that my talk of shadow producers running this show is crazy? Well, I have proof. This guy Brotherton talks a lot about conspiracy, but these aren't theories. They're actual plots. But the one you didn't hear him mention is the most disturbing of them all because it's happening right now and they don't want you to know about it. It's the presence of intergalactic lizards among us. Oh, Brotherton slipped and mentioned it, but then the shadow producers edited it out. Luckily, I rescued the clip. Check this out. You know, for the most part, conspiracy theories, they aren't proposing anything that kind of contradicts, you know, mainstream physics. There's nothing inherently that couldn't be true. Uh, until you start getting to theories like about intergalactic lizards and stuff like that. Uh, but I think they're in a different class. I think for the most part, conspiracy theories could be true, but they exist on this spectrum of plausibility. You didn't hear about the intergalactic lizards in the interview, did you? Why would they take that out unless the shadow producers were hiding the truth that they don't want you to know? And that's that lizards and other reptiles travel between galaxies, which he says violates mainstream physics. But I happen to know that he's wrong, my friend, and not just because I've done the trip myself. I read about it online. Being cold-blooded gives reptiles the edge in space travel. See, they don't have to heat the rocket. Huh? Think about it. So they're among us either disguised as earth lizards or humans. Either way, the shadow producers, who are in cahoots with the they that they don't want you to know about, don't want you to know about it. But I've got it all written down. Oh, I gotta go. Thanks to the shady characters who help produce this show, we can only theorize how they do it. 
Gary Niederhoff, and Barbara Vance. Also, thanks to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, where scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to our monthly look at critical thinking skeptic check. This episode, Fear Itself. If you'd like to hear more Skeptic Check or other Big Picture Science episodes, you'll find them in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener, but you prefer listening to over-the-air radio, because after all, it's less susceptible to being tracked by the black helicopters, well, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. And do you have a comment, a criticism, or a suggestion for us? Well, throw in some faint praise and then email it all to bigpicturescience at SETI.org. Uh-oh, here comes Seth. I gotta hide the evidence. Gary, Gary, you've got to stop this. You've got to stop with the conspiracy theories about shadow producers, intergalactic lizards, okay? What? I wasn't doing anything. Skeptic Check is brought to you thanks to a generous grant from the Trimberger Family Foundation. At the Trimberger Family Foundation, we hold that skepticism is a lamp that lights the way to truth. Trimberger.org.